Hello, everyone, and welcome to section 1.4 in pre-calculus. This function, this title is functions, and functions are the key to pre-calculus. So um, an important concept for you to understand, you did learn it in Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. So maybe you already understood it, but remember the whole year of pre-calculus is fine-tuning your algebra skills, having you go beyond just being able to do some problems to really understanding them. Many everyday phenomena involve two quantities that are related to each other by some rule of correspondence. The mathematical term for such a rule of correspondence is a relation. So any two things that are related. But a special kind of relation is a function. So they're not just related, they're related in a very special way. Here's how you can know if something is a function. First, you could be given a table, and in that table, each input value is matched with exactly one output value. Now, when I was in school, I could never remember if it was two outputs couldn't have one input or two inputs could have one output. So I actually thought of it like a machine, and this really helped me. And that is, when I put something in the machine, I knew what I was going to get out. So if I put a 2 in, I was expecting an 11. Oh, but see, this time you put a 2 in and you get a 10, not a function. When you put something in, everybody gets the same answer. Think of it like group work. Everybody in the group should put a 2 in, all the group is doing their work, and everybody needs to get the same answer. Now, it is okay for there to be two answers that are the same. So if in your machine you put in a 1 and get an 11, or you put a four in and get an 11, that's okay. But every time you put a four in, you get an 11. So it's just that you can't have one input sometimes producing a different answer. That's one way you'll know what a function is. The second way is that it passes the vertical line test. This is most people's favorite way, but it only helps if you have an actual graph. So, for example, go back and look at the one that we just did and think about it now in terms of a graph. So if the little machine example or group work example didn't help you, just think to yourself, 1 is 11, 2 is 10, 3 is 10, 4 is 11, and then 5 is 7. Anywhere that you draw a vertical line, you're only going to hit one of those values. But on this one, at 2, it's 11, and then in 2, it's 10. Okay, it can't be both 10 and 11 at the same time. If you draw a vertical line, you're going to hit two spots. That's the vertical line test. So you can use the vertical line test even if you're given a data table, if you didn't like way one. But for the most part, Things like parabolas are functions because they pass the vertical line test. Absolute value functions are functions because they pass the vertical line test. No matter where I draw a vertical line, I'm only going to hit one thing. So in Algebra 2, you are supposed to study conics, things like ellipses and hyperbolas. They were in a special section called conics because they are not functions. They do not pass the vertical line test. Even sideways parabolas don't pass the vertical line test. So a parabola has to be an upward or a downward function. Three, the third way to know if something is a function. Given a function, if you substitute a number for x, it must produce exactly one number for y. So in this case, if I put in a number for x, let's say x is equal to 3. Then I get 3 squared plus y is equal to 1. Subtract 9 from both sides. y is equal to negative 8. There's no other answer. I, I can't do this problem any other way. If x is 3, it's going to produce y is equal to negative 8. Back to my machine concept. Every time I plug in a 3, everybody should get the same answer. But on this one, I'm going to plug in an x is equal to 3. 
and I get negative 3 plus y squared is equal to 1. Add 3 to both sides. y squared is equal to 4. And remember, when you take the square root of both sides, you have to write plus or minus 2. So this one has two possibilities. If x is 3, y could be a positive 2 or a negative 2. So that produces two answers. So this one is not a function. And this one is a function. OK, that's how you know if something's a function. Couple of definitions. Um, we often talk about it in terms of input and output. Uh, once we get to algebra, we call it x and y. You might hear it referred to as the independent variable or the dependent variable. x is still x, but sometimes y is called f of x. So y and f of x, interchangeable. And lastly, y is also sometimes called the value of the function, but x is still called x. Notice that x doesn't have very many exciting possibilities for a name, but y has all different things. The output, the y, the dependent variable, f of x, the value. So you're going to have to be familiar with all of these and know that they all represent y. The symbol f of x is called function notation. And I just have already said it for you, but it's read the value of f at x, or simply f of x. So when you see this notation, this is somebody's way of saying they want you to put 4 in for x. So this would be 2 times negative 4 squared minus 3. So I take this function, and now that they're telling me that x is negative 4, I put a negative 4 in there. So 2 times 16 minus 3, 32 minus 3 is 29. Okay. I'm going to try really hard to tell you all year my warnings, things that kids do wrong. The warning on this one is that h of negative 4 is not h times negative 4. So sometimes I'll have kids do this, 2x squared minus 3 times negative 4. This would be incorrect. Okay, this means h of negative 4. You can do h of w. That simply means you're going to put a w in where there's an x. Or we could make it really comp we are going to make it really complicated. You could put a 3x minus 1 in where there's an x. So I write the two. I usually start the problem like this, no matter what I'm putting in there. That way I've written the exact function, but I've left the x spot blank. And then I just look to see what's in the parentheses, and that's what I put where there should be an x. So now you have to multiply this out. Two times another warning. Don't distribute that square, okay? This is not equal to 9x squared plus 1. Watch out. It is 9x squared inners, outers, remember your foil, plus 1, minus 3. Now you can distribute the 2. 18x squared minus 6x minus 6x plus 2 minus 3, 18x squared minus 12x minus 1. That is h of 3x minus 1. Pretty long problem. You guys did it. Nice work. For these next three examples, I'd really like you to pause this video and try them on your own. I am going to write down the answers, but when I check your work, I will be looking, when I check your notes, I will be looking for the work done out. 
So you have to actually do the work. Don't just copy down these answers. So go ahead and pause. Okay, hopefully you've come back after pausing. The answer to the first one is five. The answer to number two is negative t squared plus four t plus one. And the answer to the last one is negative x squared plus five. Now chances are if you got one of them wrong, it was number three. Number three is pretty tricky, so I'm actually gonna work out number three for you. So remember that the best way to tackle these is to actually rewrite the problem. And every time you see an X, put a set of parentheses. That's my strategy. And then I look to see what's in the parentheses and I see it's an X plus two. And that's how I fill the parentheses. Now, when something is being squared by order of operations, squaring or exponents come before subtraction. So you do have to make sure that you don't distribute that negative. That does not happen first. This is 4x plus 8 plus 1. Now I'm going to FOIL. Again, that negative is it's not time yet. Multiplication comes before subtraction. First, outer, inner, last. And while I'm multitasking here, I'm also going to make that 8 and that 1 a 9. Now I can distribute minus 2x, minus 2x. And you could, might have combined those to 4x. That's great. And now I have a minus x squared. The 2x and the 2x that are negative cancel the positive 4x. And then the negative 4 and the 9 combined together to give you the 5. And that's how I got this answer. The domain is all the things that x can be. The domain is all the things that x can be. The range is all the things that y can be. If no domain is given for a function, the implied domain, that's what goes there. The implied domain is the set of real numbers for which the expression is defined. So meaning a lot of times they don't talk about the domain. It's just implied that it's, it's all real numbers um, or all the things that make the equation true. We'll do examples and I'll show you. All right, here's the two most important things you need to know about domain. You can never, ever, ever divide by zero. So sometimes people are confused by that. Um, they, they forget that zero divided by a number is allowed. But a number divided by zero is not allowed. Okay, it's not e equal to anything. Um, the way I think about it is if you have zero dollars and you divide it among five people, they each get zero dollars. You can do that division. I mean, the answer is just going to be zero. But if you had five people, so this was people, if you had five people, and you tried to, um, oh no, no, sorry. If you had $5 and you tried to divide it among zero people, that doesn't work. You might be thinking, oh no, no, just drop it on the floor. Then zero people will get it. Now I assure you, if you drop $5 on the floor, somebody is gonna come along and get it. And that one person is gonna walk away with a $5 bill. So you can do five divided by one, but you can't do to five divided by zero. Somebody's getting that dollar. That might help you remember that you can't divide by zero. All right, radicals. You can never have a negative number under an even radical. I say even 
because I include square roots, fourth roots, six roots. We don't really do that many of them, but um, you can have a negative underneath a cube root. So there's a little two there that's implied, but we don't actually write it. Okay, a couple different examples to help you understand domain better. The basic definition of a domain is all the things that X can be. So in this case, the domain is the set of numbers negative three, negative one, zero, two, four. Where did I get those numbers? It's just all the things that X could be. In general though, you wanna start with all real numbers. You wanna just sit there and say, X could be anything, or can't it? That's where these two restrictions come in. So if you see a denominator, there's going to be a restriction. If you see a radical, there's going to be a restriction. So one over X plus five, the domain is going to be all real numbers. In case you didn't know that, that's like the parenthesis, uh, not parenthesis, the paragraph symbol, but with an R. So I make an R and I put an extra line through it. Your book does it just beautifully. You know, you got like this fancy R for all real numbers, but I just make an R and put an extra line through it. And that works. Um, so the domain is all real numbers, but X cannot be equal to negative five. Because if X is a negative five, you're going to get a zero in the denominator. Now, if you're thinking, how did she figure that out? You, you can actually do the work off to the side. You can set the denominator equal to zero, solve the equation, and that'll always tell you the answer. But a lot of times you can just look at it and say, oh, if, if X is a negative five, that's a problem. For letter C, um, there is one more very small case. This does not come up very frequently, but in a word problem, there's usually a domain. So this is a formula for volume of a sphere. It's a great formula. Um, but in it, no, no one's going to put in that the radius of the sphere is negative eight. It's a, it's a radius. It's going to be positive. So in this case, we might say that the radius, the domain is that the radius is greater than or equal to zero. There can't be a negative volume. Remember, it could be equal to zero. If you have zero radius, you have zero volume, but it can't be less than zero. Okay, here's the two hardest ones, the ones with the radicals. These trip kids up the most. You can't have a negative underneath the radical. So you have two choices for how to do these. Don't get these wrong. You have two different ways to do it. One is by a formula, which I'll show you, or two is just to think about it you can't have a negative B underneath there. So if you need this to be at least zero or positive, you can just look at it and say, well, X has got to be greater than or equal to seven. If it's equal to seven, you'll get a zero. And if it's bigger than seven, like eight or nine or 10, you're good to go. So you're welcome to just think about it. But again, I'm always going to try and give you a method for kids that struggle. So if you actually need a method, then you take what's inside, you take the inside, and you just set it greater than or equal to zero. So you, your method is to take the inside, make it greater than or equal to zero, and step two is to solve. So X is greater than or equal to seven. And see how we got the same answer? Okay, let's do the second one. This one's a lot harder. So again, there's gonna be a whole bunch of people that just think about it and they say, well, let's see, X could be zero. You know, sometimes when kids are thinking about it, they actually make a little number line. Zero, that's good. One's not a problem. Two, ooh, two. Well, at two, you'll actually get zero. At three, oh no, it can't be three. Could it be negative one? Yeah, because negative one squared, four minus negative one. Could it be negative two? Yeah, could it be negative three? No. So sometimes, literally, or I should say a lot of times, I, I feel like in the end, most kids just think it through. So X has to be between negative two and two, 
just think about it. There can't be a negative under the radical. But for those of you that are afraid, you're not going to be able to think about it. You can use the method. Step one, set the inside greater than or equal to zero. Step two, solve. Now the problem here is we haven't solved a lot of quadratic equations yet this year. You did solve them in algebra one and algebra two, but you probably forgot how to do it. So the way you solve an algebraic equation is to set it equal to zero and then to factor. So two plus X, two minus X is greater than or equal to zero. So X could be equal to negative two, like this would come out to be negative two, or X could be two. But the second thing, the second thing that makes this particular problem hard is that you probably also forgot, because we only did it for a very short time in algebra two, how to solve inequalities. Inequalities are actually always solved by making a number line. But what the original solving does is it finds the two points that are going to be the key points. So then you just have to figure out which side to shade. I usually just plug a number in. So I say to myself, oh, does three work? Three doesn't work. If you put a three and you get four minus nine, doesn't work. Not going to shade that area. Does one work? Yeah, four minus one is bigger than zero. So if one works, this entire section works. So my advice is use the method if it's a simple problem, but sometimes even with the method, if you don't remember your algebra two very well, just think about it, plug numbers in, and recognize that a linear equation always produces one answer, a square equation always produces two answers. So you should have two things in your little X there. Okay. We're going to talk about something called a piecewise function. Mathematicians, we're not very clever with our names. A piecewise function literally means it's a function that's in pieces. A function defined by two or more equations over a specified domain. So we have this function and it's saying I have different rules for different parts. So if X is negative two, I have to look at my domain and figure out which one I want to use. So it's less than three. So I'm going to use the top one. F of negative two is going to use the top formula because it's part of that domain. X is less than three. So don't forget to put the negative two in parentheses. If you forget and you just type that into your calculator like that, you're going to get the wrong answer. It's the entire X is being squared. So negative two squared plus one is five. F of three, now which one does that go into? Or equal to, X is greater than or equal to three, you use the bottom one. Use the bottom formula. So three minus one, is equal to two. You can pause it if you need to, but see if you can figure out which one you're gonna use for f of four. You should have used the bottom one, and the answer is three. Okay, go ahead and do the next example on your own. Pause the video, and I am going to write the answers but when I check your notes, I will be looking for the work. So make sure that you show me how you did it. Okay, you can skip ahead if you got them all right. If you didn't get them right, the major error comes here. So if you have x squared, 
and x is negative 2, you have to put the negative in the parentheses because this means all of x is being squared. If you have negative x squared and you had x is equal to negative 2, it still means that, oops, not that, it still means that it's in parentheses. But sometimes kids will do a negative and a negative, make a positive. But exponents come before subtraction. So this would be negative 4. In our example, for this one, it was negative 5 squared plus 3. That negative does not affect, the square does not affect the negative. This is negative 25 because exponents come before subtraction. So if you got that one wrong, that might have been why. All right, next set of examples. If you're thinking this is a hodgepodge, welcome to pre-calc. Um, Pre-calculus is literally going over every topic that you learned in Algebra 2 to make sure that they are so solidified that when you get to calculus, you can do them like you do addition now. I mean, if I gave you 3 plus 7, you just say 10. You don't even think about it. I need you to be like that when you take calculus. I need you to just look at this and say, I know exactly what that means. So what does that mean? It, this is not saying that x is equal to 0. It's f of x is equal to 0. So this is what's equal to 0. And then they want you to solve it. Find all the real values of x such that f of x is equal to 0. So you just said f of x equal to 0. Now you're in pre-calculus. You no longer need to show the little minus one, minus one. Okay, you can do that step in your head. And you don't need to show the divide by five, divide by five. You can skip straight to this. So now that you got the directions correct, it, usually kids' biggest problem is just getting this directions. This next section, you can just set it equal to zero and go for it. Um, if you would like to try them on your own, I'm going to quick put the answers along the side so that people that are just looking at the answers can see them. Um, but this is a great review of all the different types of equations you learned in algebra. Notice I'm going over ones with fractions, quadratic ones, cubic ones. So it's meant to be a review in addition to being the concept of setting the equation equal to zero. So for people that are skipping ahead, the answers are x is equal to negative one-fifth, x is equal to plus or minus two square roots of three. Do not leave it plus or minus the square root of 12. Um, oh, hold on. Oh, 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 that's wrong. I started at number one. We already did the one with one-fifth. This one is x is equal to plus or minus two square roots of three. This one is x is equal to three or five. And the last one, x is equal to plus or minus 2 and 1. You should try and do as many as you, you can on your own. If you got them right, skip to the next part of the video. But I'm going to do them out. 0 is equal to 12 minus x squared over 5. First step, clear the fraction by multiplying both sides by 5. That gives me 0 is equal to 12 minus x squared. You might be thinking, so that five didn't matter? It didn't. If a fraction is equal to zero, it must be because the top is made at zero because the bottom can never be zero, remember? I'm gonna add x squared to both sides. And this is what your screencastifies should sound like if we have to do this. And the biggest mistake kids make is forgetting the plus or minus. Seeing as you will lose half of the answers if you forget the plus or minus, you can expect to only earn half credit for that one mistake. Next one. Whenever you have an x squared in an equation, you always solve it by setting it equal to zero and factoring. Whenever you have an x squared in an equation. Set it equal to zero 
and factor. You'll hear me say this all year long. I cannot even begin to tell you how important it is. If your factoring skills are strong, they're going to become better this year. If you need help with factoring, uh, come to me during office hours. I would love to, to make you stronger at that and tell you how you do it. Um, so when two things are being multiplied to make zero, one of them must actually be zero. So either x minus 5 is zero or the x minus 3 is zero. And then when you solve those two, you get either x is equal to 5 or x is equal to 3. Last one. Even if it's a higher power than x squared, you should still try and set it equal to zero and factor. So people are always very intimidated by polynomials with four terms. They suddenly think that they can't factor, but factoring with four terms is actually easier in my opinion. You might have had a teacher that taught you grouping. By all means, go ahead, do grouping. I, I don't tend to do grouping. I just stick with my reverse FOIL. I really like reverse FOIL. In FOIL, the first times the first makes the first. So there's the first, x squared and x. And then the last times the last makes the last. So it's either going to be two and two or four and one. But what's great is that the inners and the outers are what are going to make these last two terms. So when there's four, the answer is practically staring you in the face. This has to be negative four because then the inners would be negative four X and that's one of your terms. And the outers, this must be a one. It must be actually a negative one because that way the outers would make negative X squared. And then I can check it using FOIL. First, outer, inner, last. That's how I factored that. Four terms is actually easier. When you were trying to factor this one, you know, you had to sit there and say what makes 15 and how the inners and the outers going to make eight. Um, but you had to add them up in your head. Oh, five and three will make the eight. This one you don't have to add up. It's right there. Don't forget that if you have an X squared, you should always try and keep factoring. So I'm going to keep factoring this one. And now it's the same principle. If you have two things or three things that equal zero, either A is zero, B is zero, or C is zero, okay? You can't have two things or three things get multiplied together and have zero as an answer unless one of them is zero. If I told you I have eight times something is equal to zero, it's not a surprise. That something is definitely zero. So either x plus 2 is equal to 0, or x minus 2 is equal to 0, or x minus 1 is equal to 0. So the answers are x is equal to negative 2, x is equal to 2, or x is equal to 1. Any of those three answers would make this equation true. So when kids are in Algebra 1, they often just memorize. I don't know, when I get to this step, I just take the opposite of that number. I'm not really sure why. Hopefully now that you're in pre-calc, you're learning some of the whys this year, which is why I went a little slow and really explained that out, which is also why I said you can always skip ahead if you are already really good at that stuff and have a strong foundation. So here's an example where this, is, this was never done in Algebra 2, but it's not that big a stretch. It's seeing if you can read the directions. Find the values of x for which f of x is equal to g of x. So I'm literally going to set f of x equal to g of x. Oh, and real quick, I think I'm just going to write down the answers for people that are skipping ahead. Again, this is why I'm collecting your notes <laughs> and checking them, because it's not just about the answers, it's about the work. But I also don't want anybody to be watching long videos that already understand what they're doing. All right, whenever you have something that has an x squared or higher in it, set it equal to zero and factor.
So I subtract 2x squared from both sides, and I get x to the fourth minus 4x squared is equal to 0. One of the most important kinds of factoring is factoring out. People sometimes forget that one. So you can take an x squared out of both of these, and you're left with x squared minus 4. And that gives you x, if I want to factor that just a little further, times x, times x plus 2, times x minus 2. So I have four things that the answer could be. Any one of those four things could make the equation equal to 0. Either x is 0, or x is 0, which is silly to write twice, you don't have to write it twice. Or x plus 2 is equal to 0, or x minus 2 is equal to 0 x is equal to negative 2, just going to finish solving this, and those are your answers. Okay, back to what I said before, whenever you have an x squared or higher in an equation, set it equal to 0 and factor. Can't stress it enough. Number 2, we're going to set f of x equal to g of x. That's what they're asking us to do. Square root of x minus 4 is equal to 2 minus x. In case you've forgotten from algebra 2, when you have a radical in equation, you always isolate the radical. So I'm going to add 4 to both sides. And I get the square root of x is equal to 6 minus x. Once you've isolated the radical, that's step 1. Step two is square both sides. So I'm going to square both sides. And I get x squared is equal to, now some of you it might be safer for you to actually write this out. Okay? It is not 36 minus x squared. If you wrote 36 minus x squared, Shame on you. You're in pre-calculus. You can't do that. So instead, it's 36 minus 6x first, outer, inner, last. So now, um, oops, I just realized I made a mistake. Nobody's here to catch it for me. Nobody's here to go, Mrs. Schaefer. Um, but when you square a square root, you just get x. All right, I'm going to say it again. Whenever you have an x squared in your equation, set it equal to zero and factor. I see an x squared in my equation. I'm going to set it equal to zero. I'm going to do a couple steps at once. I'm going to put it in descending order. This is all together minus 13x. And now I factor. So the first times the first makes the first. The last times the last makes the last. But my choices are 1 in 36, 2 in 18, 3 in 12, 4 in 9, uh, I think that, uh, 6 and 6. I got choices. <laughs> so remember that the inners and the outers have to add up to the middle term. So I'm going to pick 9 and 4. And then my inners are negative 9x and my outers are negative 4x. Knowing your factors and having some choices in front of you will make it easier for you. So either x minus 9 is 0 or x minus 4 is equal to 0. So the answers are 9 or 4. All right, word problem applications. That's always a good sign. It means we're almost done. We have three problems left. You work in the marketing department of a soft drink company and are experimenting with a new can for iced tea that is slightly narrower and taller than a standard can. Can you guess who we're talking about? I think it was when Arizona iced tea came out, that this book came out. For your experimental can, the ratio of the height to the radius is four. Now people struggle with that when they say the word ratio and then they give a single number, they're like, that's not a ratio. But remember, you can write that as four to one. So if there's no denominator, then it would be a 1. So the ratio of the height to the radius 
is four to one. Write the volume of the can as a function of the radius. This is how you would write that. The volume of the can as a function of the radius. That means that you want an equation with only R in it. So if somebody said to you, well, let's see, if it has a radius of two, what is the volume gonna be? If it has a radius of six, what is the volume gonna be? The reason that this is a challenging problem is because volume actually has of a cylinder, the formula for the volume is pi r squared h. So right now it's a function of r and h. They want it to be just v of r, but they've given you a ratio here. So I can replace the h. h is equal to, by clearing the fraction, multiply both sides by r, h is equal to 4r. I can rewrite this where now the h is 4r. And I get 4 pi, most people put the number out in front, then the pi, r cubed. That's how you can write it as a function of r. Now you don't have to figure out the height. If you just know the r, the radius, you'll know the volume of the can. Now, there's two problems here because they want you to try it again as a function of h. That is significantly harder. You should go ahead and you should try it on your own, but I will do it out. The answer, for those of you who just want to look ahead, is 1 16th pi h cubed. So I'm going to go ahead and do that out for people that would like to see it. If you got that, if that made sense, then you can skip this. I'm going to start again with volume is equal to pi r squared h, but this time I'd like to keep the h and get rid of the r. So I'm going to go back to this equation and I'm going to get the r all by itself. So r is equal to 4 over h. 4 over h. I don't know why I wrote that. h over 4. I flipped them upside down. It's so weird. Um, r is h over 4 h over 4. So I get pi times h squared over 16 times h, and that gives me pi h cubed over 16, which is the same as 1 16th pi h cubed. To divide something by 16 is the same as to multiply it by 1 over 16. Really actually important concept. Half of something is the same as taking something and dividing by two. This year, I'll definitely need you to recognize that these are the same, because it'll happen a lot. Okay, two more word problems. You are welcome to just try them on your own. I'm gonna quick show you the answers to both of them. Um, this one, the answer is F of 300, is equal to 15, so yes. And the answer to the next one is V of 1998 is equal to 299.9 thousand. Be careful, if you don't have that thousand, it'll be wrong. So we would write it as 299,900. All right, so those are the two answers if you don't need to see the problem worked out. But I am going to work them out. A baseball is hit at a point three feet above the ground. Because think about that. If you have like a player, I would normally stand up and do this in class, and he's got his bat, which is, it'd be so much better if I did it in person, because as goofy as I look, my drawings are worse. But, you know, when he brings that bat around and swings it, it it's probably about three feet off the ground. So he hits it, it's about three feet off the ground, and 
this this slope on this parabola is really shallow okay it's not like he did a fly ball or it didn't go way up in the air but 300 feet away there is a fence okay and that that fence is 10 feet high so what their question is is will the ball clear the fence in other words, what you want to know is how high is the ball when X is 300? And they've given you this function, and this function tells you, um, uh, where is it? The path of the baseball is given by the function where X and Y are measured in feet, where X is the distance away and Y is the height. So distance away and y is the height of the ball. So if you figure out f of 300, you just have to plug it into your calculator. 300 squared. Don't do it in pieces. Literally type this entire thing just like that into your calculator. It'll do it for you. And you'll get 15 which means that when the ball is 300 feet out linearly, it's 15 feet in the air. Well, since the fence is only 10 feet up, the ball's gonna clear it. Last one. This example is really important to me because this is gonna happen a lot this year where you look at a problem and it's almost just intimidating just to read it. But this is actually the easiest problem we're going to do all day. I'll read it real quick. The number V in thousands of alternative fueled vehicles in the United States increased in a linear pattern from 1995 to 1999. Then in 2000, the number of vehicles took a jump. And until 2002, it increased in a different linear pattern. And these two patterns can be approximated by this function. So in other words, the number of alternative fuel vehicles was growing, but then with a slope of 18, but then look at the new slope. Starting in the year 2000, it really took off. So this is what we call a piecewise function. They're saying, use this function to approximate the number of alternative fuel vehicles in 1998. This goes back to the problem where we were trying to figure out which function to use, the top one or the bottom one. Remember that? That's really all this is. So they gave you a whole bunch of words that look confusing just to see if you knew which function you should use. So keep in mind that t is equal to 5 is 1995. So this is really 1995 to 1999. And that 10 represents 2000. And this represents 2002. So 1998 is going to be in that first one. So to do V of 1998, you're going to actually use 18.08. .08, and the number you're actually going to use is just an 8, not actually 1998. So there's a little bit of a misnomer. 1998's number of alternatively fueled vehicles is represented by V of 8. And if you multiply that out, you'll get 299.9. But be really careful. It's measured in thousands. This is another place that kids go wrong. Watch your units. So in other words, they tried to make the number easier to deal with in the formula, but then they've added a unit, thousands. I do not want you to write your answer this way. You, you need to actually write it as a real number. So 299.9 thousands is 299,900. So they had a lot of words, um, but the tricky part of this problem was was actually probably more with the 1995 and 1999, that whole piece of it. Uh, but their actual intent was just to see if you knew which piecewise function to plug it into, the top or the bottom. 
You did it. You finished the whole lesson. Um, don't forget that you are always doing odds only so that you can check your answers. Okay, make sure you always check your answers. I am going to be checking your problem sets to make sure that you're doing them right. Um, and also so that you can ask questions. You get one wrong, that's what you bring to class for me. Um, and also, you'll see that these last ones are in a what they call skill review. So those are going to start to be on your quizzes. Make sure you do those and ask me about them. It's supposed to be bringing back your algebra too. And the skill reviews always are trying to help you for the next lesson. So something in 1.5 must need those two skill reviews. And finally, there's an answer in the back of the book that's wrong. So take a note that um, the correct answer is Y is greater than 10. All right, that's it. Have a great day.